Okay, so my pleasure today is to introduce our second speaker, David Wilson. Professor Wilson's research centers on the political economy of cities of the global north, such as Flint, Michigan, and Chicago. It's a very long list of articles and unit. We don't give long, long, long introductions. I'll simply say that his most recent book is the co-edited Rutledge Handbook on Spaces of Urban Politics, and that was published four years ago. David's academic home is the Department of Geography and Geographic Information Science, GIF. He also has affiliate appointments in the Department of African American Studies, and you're also in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. I right? am. Yeah, because it's not on the website, my friend. Oh, it's not? No, yeah. All right. Well, wait a second. Missing. Hold up. I'm going to have Same. to change that. Uh, and an affiliate of the unit, and is also, I should add, one of the three newly elected members of the unit's advisory board. We have Ramon, who's one of them, and Shelley my work is one of them. So you guys are all here. <laughs> all right, with that, take it away. Fantastic. Thank yeah. you, Dee Dee. Um, I'm going to shed this. Nobody's threatened or anything. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, if I get freaked out in the middle of the talk, I'm going to put it on. So I'm going to keep it close by. Um, so um, Dee Dee, thanks so much for inviting me. It's, it's really such a pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to talk to the unit people. Um, I'm creating a monolith, the unit people, but yeah. And um, it's, it's great to engage you. Um, I, I have to let you know that um, I've been in fairly strict quarantine for about three years now. So uh, I guess I'll give you fair warning that I'm still relearning my social skills. <laughs> and at the same time, um, I'm still learning how to talk in public because that's just the way the process is, is rolling out. So um, if I get excessively narrow, and it looks like I'm fixating on um, a Zoom box, that's just tradition and my recent history. So I give you fair warning about that. Um, but you're not wearing PJs at least. That's right. I, well, <laughs> I thought about it, actually, to, to simulate the environment. But I, <laughs> right. Um, so today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, cities and the process of urbanization. And in so doing, um, I have to say that one of my colleagues, who shall be unmentioned, said something very poignant to me. And he said, you know, the two most interesting things in the world are people and cities, because they are the most ambiguous but intoxicating things that involve the human experience. So who am I to disagree? And uh, that's going to carry me. That said, um, I'm going to talk off a text. And I talked with Didi about this. And the reason why I do that is because my fear is that if I start talking, I'm going to wander, and I won't exactly say what I really want to say. I, I will not be able to get in all the details. So I will talk off the text, and do bear with me. Um, and one final quick proviso. Um, with this talk, I am not going to posture as the definitive unit authority on cities. That's not my intention here. What I really want to do is to talk to you about my journey into the latest trends in critical urban studies and see how you feel about it and get your responses. Um, and this whole hierarchy of the unit lecturer, I lower my voice when I say that, the unit lecturer, and everybody else, um, I shed that. So those are my provisos. And let me begin by saying that uh, the capitalist city as an, as an analytic object has long interested critical theorists. And uh, critical theorists have sought to understand the city through a diversity of perspectives. Um, and the ones that immediately come to mind for me, which I think many of you are familiar with, is neoclassical analysis and institutionalist studies, um, sometimes called managerial studies, and hermeneutic inquiry, and neo-Marxist analysis, and there are others as well. And what's so interesting to me about each of these perspectives is that they always give us a dialectic of blindness and insight. 
They all give us something meaningful and important, and yet at the same time, they shed a kind of shadow for us. And that's one of the reasons why it's so interesting to take many of the urban realities that we see today and to funnel them through each of the lenses to see what they have to say and how they can inform us and also enslave us. Um, so my presentation um, is to identify and explore four recent conceptual trends that I see in critical urban studies. And as a geographer, critical urban studies slash geography, um, whatever that is. Um, I have to be very upfront with the idea that this is a subjective list, the four. It's really David Wilson's world. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, so in David Wilson's world, I identify these four meaningful things. Now, I could have come up with four others, or I could have done a switch and taken two out and added two additional ones, or, you know, mix and match and stuff. But I like the four ones I chose. So precisely why did I choose them? Um, well, I chose them for the following reasons. Um, to me, they put out there what I would call an epistemic obedience. And by epistemic obedience, what I mean is that they are disobedient. That is, they challenge what we claim to know in a meaningful way. And uh, to me, that's important. Uh, the four that I touch on also provide important conceptual openings for us in terms of enacting progressive imaginings and also potential urban policy that can follow from that. So that's an important set of criteria, criteria for me as well. Uh, for example, in a couple of moments, I'll be talking about planetary urbanization. And what I'm going to say is that planetary urbanization fundamentally attacks a standard binary that so many urbanists have sworn an allegiance to, and that's core periphery, the core periphery distinction. Um, I'll also be talking about decline machines, whatever that is, decline machines. And there, decline machines give us a dramatically different interpretation of the very essence of decline in our urban environments, how we interpret decline, and an interpretation that's quite different than, in my mind, the way it's traditionally been cast and the way it's traditionally been interpreted. And finally, I just like these four, you know, so I thought it would be fun to talk about. So that's why I chose them. Okay, um, innovation number one. Notice how I'm keeping in the dark about the innovations until I get to them. Um, let's see how this thing moves. There we are. Innovation number one is the planetary urbanist concept. And another way to phrase this is that it is a journey into the turbulent ideas of Henri Lefebvre. Um, so what are we to make of the controversial planetary urbaniz urbanization concept today? Its origins in the musings of French philosopher Henri Lefebvre decades ago provocatively noted that there is no longer anything in the world outside the urban. Now to me, that's quite a statement. That is tantalizingly elusive. And in the urban revolution, Lefebvre anticipated the rise of a planetary fabric from an ever restless expanding capitalist urbanization that would profoundly and intimately touch many places. The concept's most fervent advocates today, Neil Brenner and Christian Schmidt, I wish they were here to comment, um, declare the concept essential to understanding the planet's most powerful place restructuring force, and that is urban growth. Charted out is a variegated, centerless urbanization, what um, Lefebvre termed the concentration, deconcentration simultaneity. And it's a thing that encompasses multiple connecting processes, notably uneven development, transnational human movement, 
current modes of production and communications, and on the ground human negotiation of place, emergent cultural forms. In places, they say, and the concept tells us, urbanization concentrates, but also expands outward in all directions and comes to infiltrate the fabric of many things, including the lived in worlds of human beings in expected and unexpected ways. So I want to suggest that there are at least two major strengths in Brenner's and Schmidt's planetary urbanist concept. First, the concept stresses the importance of examining a notion of the urban rather than a notion of the city and in a meaningful way. In declaration, the days of ontological cityism and methodological cityism are over. And they must give way to the recognition of a process-based, place-transcending urbanism. Here the city bearing important processes is a kind of mask, a complicated and falsely transparent space. Its constellation of multi-scale roots can at best be scantily seen. Claims in tr to truth defy the empirically immediate. Causation is always inscribed in networks of relays and differential traces. The urban it follows is something that can at best be sketchily bounded. And it's a phenomenon that stretches across vast terrains, moves through and across innumerable places, and never fully reveals itself in easily identifiable ways. The urban then shows itself with both great clarity and occluded shadows. The physical city, its buildings, streets, social relations, and immediate builders of these, is but one visuality. It's but one showing in a complicated process. Second, about planetary urbanization. The concept embraces an innovative notion of urbanization itself, what it is on the ground. And Lefebvre talks about, and especially Brenner and um, Schmidt talk about, the reality that it is a liminal process that expands as a kind of dispersal of fragments to shape the vastness of places. A restless extending and agglomerating urbanization, it moves in, it moves out, proceeds often imperceptibly to infiltrate the hermeneutics, the material, the physical, the social, and the political. All intersect as aspects of lived worlds. So far from a brute and blunt imposition, urbanization insinuates itself across the globe in everyday life as it interfaces with a multitude of things. And that includes the thoughts, the desires, the meanings, the structuring conditions for human materiality, opportunity structures for political mobilization, everyday actions, and physical morphologies. So it is Abdul Malik Simone's, what he calls the shadow of place transformation, that moves into the vastness of social life in the form of traces and in the form of fragments. So paraphrasing the urbanist Andy Merrifield, this urban is a fabric of immense complexity that stretches to envelop vast places and touches the most intimate of lived worlds. So in sum, I feel like I should get to number two very quickly. Um, in sum, the planetary urbanization concept identifies the need to see urbanization in a new way. That is, as a variegated, centerless unfolding. Now obviously, um, for a long time now, urbanists and, and theorists, critical theorists, have identified that cities have connections. They have vast connections at different scales. Cities are multi-scalar phenomena. But what the planetary urbanization concept informs us is that, in fact, this is not only true, but that we can begin to think of cities as truly centerless things, that is, urbanization as centerless things. And so, I'll elaborate later. <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's at the core of the thing.
Innovation two. The rise of Dracula urbanism, which is very new, very recent. So I like to think this is very cutting edge. Um, and I'm going to call this Journeys into the Application of Monster Metaphors. And by the way, monster metaphors are actually a passion among urbanists. They can't quite seem to get away from them. So urbanists have long been intrigued by the application of monster metaphors to understand the intricacies of the capitalist city. The power of the metaphor to understand and communicate is, of course, very well known. In recent years, urban studies has witnessed the rise of the provocative concept Frankenstein urbanism. And referenced is a patched together pseudoscientific creation of a creature designed to deepen the city's current neoliberalization. It is to me an important development and worthy of substantive scrutiny and development. And that's the reason why I assign the Cugarello reading. Um, and he was almost here this evening, but not to be. Uh, so this Frankenstein creature bluntly moves forward, exacerbating inequalities, and proceeds to create further unanticipated consequences for people, spaces, and their creators. It deepens an already turbulent, contradictory-ridden city. And you've done the reading, so it's pretty clear. Recently, select urbanists, still in an introductory engagement stage, have modified this research pathway by suggesting something else and suggesting the simultaneity of, a non of, of another monster metaphor or another monster on the loose, now lurking in many capitalist cities, what's been called the Dracula urbanist formation. So I see this, I interpret this, this Dracula urbanism, as a deep reaching, punishing unfolding that is simultaneously a state of mind, a mode of institutional operation, a vision of people, one gaze onto growth's true needs and a kind of growth produced. So its reach is impressive. This position stakes out the belief that Dracula-like beliefs and conduct are not dead to time and fiction, but powerfully lurk today to build places and regions across the globe. Dracula urbanism, to its advocates, is not a new emergence. It's not a clear break from past trends but rather it's a missed set of truths that urbanists have not yet fully recognized and encountered. So this analytic gaze draws on the original rendition of Dracula, Bram Stoker's 1897 fictitious vampire and Transylvania nobleman who lived in a crumbling castle in the Carpathian Mountains. It puts aside for a moment Stoker's obvious imperialist sensibilities, Gothic stereotypes, and patchy understanding of Transylvania and people in Romania. To its advocates, Stoker's narrative here is worthy of consideration. Beneath a veneer of aristocratic charm, the Count possesses a concealed and dark soul. Polite, cunning, and conniving, he assumes many forms. Respectable scientist, an animal, a technocratic curator of science and history. To flourish, he lives off the blood of hypnotized, unwilling culprits to acquire power that transforms people and their ways. And especially important in this, Dracula also believes that it is only through the imposition of death that rebirth and life can begin. So rather than rehabilitating or therapeutizing the supposed non-correctable inferior and flawed, you eradicate much of what they are. That's the goal. Stoker's Dracula, reflecting the era's British imperialist sensibilities, serves up a relentlessly punishing character intent on purifying a deeply ruptured world. So the Dracula urbanist notion applied to cities and their governances today, um, I see them as having four central features. First, the political and economic resources to drive growth 
are secured through a key maneuver, thickened parasitic relations, particularly with upper level sources of power and authority. This is not simply a force dependency. It is an elaborate social subsisting through other entities. Urban governance is today, right, in the era of neoliberalism and in the era of austerity, particularly in a place like the United States and in much of Western Europe. Urban governances need money, political capital, and social legitimacy. All of these things have diminished in current times. So all of, these, all of these things have shrunk in neoliberal days. And the necessity to obtain these by forging functional social seductions is there. And this theory suggests, this gaze suggests, that that's what's going on today. So um, the forging of parasitic relations with whom? With foundations? with banks, et cetera. These are the new resource providers in the current world that we live in. So um, second, um, growth involves unrelenting drives to kill and destroy, not rehabilitate or therapeutize, as I just noticed, as I just noted. And uh, the drive is to rehabilitate supposedly deep civic cancers, especially the poor's ways, um, and often the racialized poor's ways, that are presumed anti-civic, morally and culturally deficient, defective dispositions, and, as I say, their ways. These are the people that purportedly constitute place-destructive threats. The poor, imagined as decrepit, or degenerate or hopelessly disorganized and chaotic, simultaneously represent a wretched community. That's the way they're seen in the new neoliberalist vista. And are a wretched community unto themselves. This, hard, this hardest of neoliberal edges is what I would call the kill the city back to greatness as a logic whose full ambitions can often not be presented in full clarity. So, I'll get to this in a second. <laughs> Third, um, growth is promoted through, st through strategically deploying the materiality and the discursive terrors of decline, creating new kinds of techno-dystopian narrative objects. The belief. The belief. Just as Dracula strategically uses decline to identify the, ven the venomous things in need of change, the genetically defective, culturally inferior stocks of people, socially backward communities in Transylvania and London, and to politically seduced subjects, um, the attraction and mystique of Gothic decrepit castles and landscapes. Power brokers in cities today are doing much of the same thing. These entities today working through eroded neighborhoods, crumbling districts, boarded up housing, and decayed infrastructures, push their growth, whose destruction of purported city cancers takes the form of new market opportunities, new demonstration projects, and testing grounds for what's been called sustainability and for what's been called resilience. And much of us know about that, that jivey stuff, you know, about what cities are supposed to become. With vanishing financial and discursive resources in present days, decline becomes a key driving element of growth. And of course, fourth, um, local growth is decisively integrated into planetary urbanizations through vast stretching circuits of capital investment and techno-scientific claims to expertise. So I think there's a really important point here. And the important point is that in the Dracula urbanist vision, yes, revanchism exists in many cities across the globe. And the wondrous geographer Neil Smith, I believe, was correct in identifying that with the rise of neoliberalism, a new flagrantly punishing call out of the urban poor and the supposedly undeserving is done. There's an active identifying of the have-nots and, and illuminating them and um, 
policy becomes constructed around eviscerating their lives. But at this moment, to advocates of the Dracula urbanist notion, revanchism is accompanied by a partner, a deeper, powerfully sinner, sinister politics of urban growth. This governance politics reaches deeply. It is immensely adaptive and spatially elusive. While revanchism mixes anger and vengeance with classic moral panics, defining clear threats, stereotyping main characters as species of monsters, um, unveiling brute and simple solutions, Dracula urbanism sneakily seeks to eradicate the supposed degenerate. So the former, that is revanchism, basks in the courage of confronting a supposedly vile set of symbols, whereas the latter silently executes destruction of people's ways and means. Now, I'm not suggesting, and this work does not suggest a conspiracy. It's not a grand conspiracy to do this. But rather, it's operating at the level of deep truths. And deep truths in the habitats of everyday life have a way of infiltrating into public policy and into people's actions, and especially the shakers and movers that seek to create things like smart cities, resilient cities, and so forth. So it does become possible to think of revanchism and Dracula urbanism as occurring simultaneously. So urban growth across the globe, of course, has a long history of killing off people's ways and their spaces. Histories of growth to Rossi have destroyed as much as they've built. But this Dracula-esque vision of the current scene suggests something distinctive, eerily reminiscent of Stoker's 19th century world. Its operatives target the dispositions and cultures of supposedly irredeemable populations. And they darkly build into their actions the demise of these dispositions and cultures. And also, they obscure the push for their long-term goals and programs, all under the notion of civic upgrading. If revanchist politics is elaborate spectacle, Dracula-esque politics is furtive and underbelly-like. Today, revanchist sensibilities and actions, clear and visible, are accompanied by a shadowy destruction that dimly registers in the public consciousness of too many. And again, my text tells me, I should say, <laughs> um, there's not the suggestion of conspiracy here. This is not a dark plot of people you know, arranging this phenomenon. It occurs in the realm of the unbroken, everyday sense of truths and how those pervasively infiltrate common discourse, common understanding, and public policy. Innovation three. And this is not working. Let's try again. It's frozen. Well, I mean, the slides are not really, sp I'm sorry? Your computer or the thing up here? I don't know. Well, I can just talk about stuff. Oh, there it is. You are, you're wondrous. That, that was great. Thanks. This is a blues club on the south side of Chicago. And um, I just want to show it. But the reason why I'm showing it is because um, it actually gets at innovation number three. And that's the people as infrastructure notion. So innovation three, the people as infrastructure notion, that I think is really quite important and very provocative. So casual notions of research reportage can unexpectedly reverberate powerfully through a field of study. Abdul Malik Simone's idea of people as infrastructure is one such notion. Its origins, a formulation at a workshop in Johannesburg in 2002, has grown into a central referent to understand the enriching, shadowy collaborations and alliances that subalterns creatively make and they creatively forge in currently afflicting capitalist cities, and particularly in the global south.
But I would make the case that, in fact, you see it in the global north today as well. Simone's goal was nothing less than to simultaneously broaden the infrastructure notion and to offer a fundamental ontological challenge to its scope and breadth. To Simone, the term infrastructure, mobilized to understand these populations, has been cast primarily in one way, as a physical morphological provisioning. Simone finds this deeply problematic. A focus on engineered systems, power stations, mass transit lines, road networks, coal burning facilities, sewer systems, to him was incomplete in identifying what backbones the complexities of an ever evolving ephemeral socio-spatial life in our cities. Um, yes, we must recognize that the people's infrastructure notion bears similarities to past ideas about political resistance. Because he's talking to us about a kind of subterranean political resistance. And I think immediately of Asef Bayet's notion of ordinary politics. But there are key differences here. Um, the people's infrastructure concept, in my reading of it, um, has emerged as a distinctive notion in five important ways. It is, in short, a significant reconceptualization. First, subalterns using this politics tactically decide to richly entangle with the day's ordinariness, and an ordinariness that is seen as ephemer ephemeral and evolving. So this politics, which is often concealed from monitoring by accepted regularity and social normativeness, becomes difficult to discern from the outsider's gaze. Subalterns thus reject a visible and flagrant offer of politics, instead performing a casual political unleashing that embeds in the always becoming flow of the social. Resistance politics, it follows, is not a stand by itself thing. It's not a discrete, identifiable social object, but is instead inseparable from daily life's rhythms that come to embed improvisational and elaborately coordinated actions. Miller calls this invisible politics, but with an important qualifier. It can be, it can be observed as a politics and embraced as a politics by confidants and collaborators. So subalterns intimately see these political acts. They feel them and integrate their repercussions into daily offers. Um, the reason why I show this graphic is because I actually used this concept and studied political resistance in blues clubs on Chicago's South Side. And um, it, was, it was really quite a set of findings. It was quite a realization for me. Um, very briefly, um, Chicago now is seeing the third wave of gentrification. Gentrification has moved beyond the north side. For those of you that know Chicago, um, it's moved beyond the loop beyond the South Loop, and has now moved to the South Side itself. And it's now transforming Bronzeville. And actually, blues clubs now have been seized as objects to facilitate the valorization of land and to drive gentrification. The irony, of course, is that these very blues clubs were off the public policy radar for decades. They were forgotten. They were relegated to the status of ghetto. But uh, there were opportunities for profitable investment on the South Side. And all of a sudden, these clubs began to change. And it's been a very contentious process for the owners of the clubs. The contentious process is that the owners themselves um, see themselves very often as fellow subalterns. And they have a desire to please what they see as their major constituency. But they also see dollar signs. And they see the possibility to upgrade. So these clubs, and this one is Lee's Unleaded on the south side, on South 74th Street. And as the club's upgrading, it has its usual symptoms. All of a sudden, there's a cover charge, fancy wine. Um, the one that the clubbers often talk about is Malbec and Shiraz. All of a sudden, they're there. right? They weren't there before. All of a sudden, now they're being sold. And that infuriates the long-term clubbers who have been going to these clubs for decades. So what do they do? They've actually enacted a very ingenious kind of resistance politics. 
and it follows very closely from what I've just talked about. And it's a politics that doesn't do a deliberate assault on practices, on the practices of upscaling, but rather it offers a kind of gentle assault on the meanings that are embedded in practices. Because it doesn't want to be identified as a politics. And yet it wants to influence one key decision maker. And that key decision maker is the owners of the clubs. And the long-term clubbers say, this is an amazing phenomenon because we recognize that the owners are torn about what to do. They've got to economically subsist, economically survive. But also, they do have an allegiance to their long-term brethren. And there's an attempt to use all kinds of political tropes to make that, that pitch to the owners. And in certain conditions, certain cases, it's been successful. In other cases and circumstances, it has not worked. So that's, um, right, I'm running out of time. So that, that's the third one. Let me get to the fourth. Innovation number four. Um, the rise of decline machines. And I have no fancy topic for this. Um, That's Detroit. When I think of decline machines, I think of Detroit. Bear with me on that one. Um, the notion of decline machine, meant to revise the growth machine model rather than supplant it, loosely roots in the original notion as conceived by Harvey Malach way back in 1976. And uh, the growth machine notion, still widely used, explains city development in the post-Fordist period through the power of pro-growth alliances, builders, developers, right? Um, city officials, city planners, all creating an alliance of power to transform the city to their specifications. For example, let's smarten up the city, um, which is the latest rage. Uh, the city to Malach is a place of turbulence, antagonisms, and political contestation. And these two groups, Use um, value advocates and exchange value advocates are at the source of political uh, contentiousness and controversy. The notion of decline machines changes things up. It centers these two contesting groups, those who want to intensify the value of land versus those who want to make a decent life on land, the fundamental conflict in our cities. And it moves beyond the narrow view that decline is more than simply neglected or discarded physical entities and cities. Things like eroded neighborhoods, crumbling districts, boarded up housing, decayed infrastructures, those sorts of things. And inspired by the now well-established discursive turn in urban studies, it sees decline as a powerful resonant imagery that is constitutive and it is humanly used and humanly deployed rather than decline being passive and inert. So we typically think of decline as being the antithesis of growth, right? Decline is um, the end product of growth's residual dimensions. And lo and behold, there's this kind of leftover stuff that gets marginalized. And the decline machine concept says no. Actually, in this day and age, decline, both as a material phenomenon and as a discursive product, can actually be mobilized as a resource and put into play as a resource that actually advances the agendas of growth alliances. So in effect, it collapses the duality, the distinction between growth and decline. And it even says and suggests strongly that growth in many instances actually depends upon decline in order to advance its, its political agenda. That's at the heart of the decline machine notion. So um, urban studies, including critical urban studies, typically situates decline as growth's supposed po solar opposite, polar opposite, <laughs> the end product of neglect and disinvestment. It's the isolated, the residual, the left to the margins. No, that's not what this new casting is all about. It changes up that notion. Optimus. Okay. Um, and 
In this idea, in the empiricizing of the decline machine concept, um, very often what's brought out is that what decline is as an imagining is actually profoundly racialized. That race and racialization becomes a meaningful resource that gets deployed to promote the agenda of redevelopment machines. And the reading that you had on Flint, Michigan, I think chronicles that pretty well. And in places like Flint, what's going on is that decline is, is fundamentally racialized. And there is this really, I'll call it peculiar process, whereby um, decline actually takes on different forms and becomes mobilized simultaneously in different ways. So decline as blackness in the case of Flint and in other cities. Blackness is identified as a kind of imagined, primordial, atavistic cultural phenomenon. And there's the recognition that white bourgeois populations want to have some contact with it, but they want to keep a distance from it. So downtowns, in an abstract way, build in blackness into their redevelopment schemes. So you see raced restaurants and raced clothing stores. And you see those kinds of things. And blackness, in a way, through a, a gross caricature, gets celebrated. But there's another side to it. And decline is used as a fear phenomenon. And the actual bodies, the bodies of blackness that are imagined, are to be kept out of the downtown. Use the abstract symbolism of blackness, but the tangible on the ground black body is not allowed to be there. So you actually see planning endeavors um, where there's upscale zoning implemented and new uh, uh, broken windows policing strategies. And those things are profoundly racialized. And what's going on in this interpretation is that um, decline is this resource, this perverse resource, that's very much put into play in narratives of urban change and urban revitalization. OK, I did my two minutes. Um, can I conclude with 30 seconds? <laughs> um, my brief talk has identified four major new developments in critical urban studies. But I've also impose, imposed a multiplicity of silences and erasures. I recognize that. Such trends as racial capitalism, smart city mania and its critiques, the digital and algorithmic turn, feminist historical materialism, new global north, global south relational understandings, global south, global south relational understandings, I have not talked about. Um, maybe next year. Um, but they were not on my docket. Um, so human choice and human subjectivity have entered my talk that I do have to acknowledge. I've also proceeded with an analytic category, the capitalist city. And I have created a, a fairly simple monolith. Capitalist cities are actually heterogeneous, and they're very rich. And people like Jamie Peck talk about how cities are formed through a conjuncturalist analysis, conjunctures of forces that converge upon sites. And cities become these thickly complicated places. So Detroit is not Cleveland. Flint is not Jakarta, and so forth. I haven't dealt with that in my talk. That's a, an erasure as well. Um, so that's me, and that's, that's urbanism. <laughs> <laughs> David Wilson's rendition. I'll stop. Want to take questions? Sure. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with Michael first. Oh, Michael, yeah. Fire away. I, 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 thanks for this wonderful presentation. I'm curious about the uh, the the horror metaphors in in uh, urban studies 
to what extent are they imagery versus metaphor? And the reason I say that in, in thinking about the Dracula story, there is a whole recursive aspect in the Dracula story where people that are victims of vampires become vampires themselves. There is also ultimately the Dracula story results in the death of Dracula. So is there something inherently revolutionary in there, or do we just, is, in, in, in the other ways, I know this is your project with, with Dracula, but in these other uh, uh, ways that these horror stories, there's a whole rich theme of plot that goes through this. Are they part a, of this? A rich theme of what? Plot. P-L-O-T. Plot. That, that I, I, are, the, are those things part, do you see those as part of where this is going, or does it just stop with, oh, that there, there are these, these folks sucking the blood out of these cities and leaving, leaving their bodies to yeah. decay? Yeah, it's a good question. I see it as though it is not explicit plot. So I, I don't see Dracula urbanism. I, would, I actually identify it as a phenomenon in cities that I'm studying. But I, I don't see it as a plot in the sense that people are rallying around it as an explicit recognition. Rather, it, it's unfolding in the unbroken, taken for grantedness of urban life. And the social roles and the economic and political roles that key actors take on they operate on the basis of deep, deeply felt truths. And they are, in a way, subjects of these neoliberal times that we live in. And um, if you talk with them, you actually gain a recognition that um, they're feeling that there is a bunch of have-nots in the city, and they don't come out and say it, but they feel that there's a, dege a degenerate population a population um, that's culturally aberrant, a population that um, is not so much in need of therapy or in need of um, rehabilitation. The best bet, if you want to make a go of, of revitalizing the city, is to find a way to, for example, jettison them from the city. And that's why we see, for example, so much public policy now in cities, say in the United States, of oriented around um, destroying the neighborhoods of the racialized poor and building little, if any, alternative housing for them. And the insinuation is, get out of here. You know, um, we're not going to build housing for you because, in a way, the truth is, we need a better population in the city. You know who we need? We need the creative class. That's what they're thinking. We need the creatives. So much for our welfare as population. Now, again, it's not always articulated that way. Lou. Yeah, I think you always uh, spark a lot of thought. Uh, and, uh, there's uh, a different, uh, I have a bunch of, I have four points, but I won't go through them. Too, but, You're welcome uh, to come. <laughs> but the, for each one of them, actually, um, number one, I wonder what you think of David Harvey's point in his uh, essay on Postmodernity that um, in place of ethics has occurred aesthetics yeah. in aestheticizing the climb. And mm -hmm. I mean, the last thing one should also realize is that Dracula is, a, <laughs> is an aesthetic work. Uh, it is a, it's, it's a book, it's, a, it's an album. Right. So I, I wonder what you think about that. He, his, his example, the Blade Runner. How the ghetto sure. becomes a mezzanine scene to the background for right. a white narrative, uh, right. whatever, right. uh, postmodern narrative. That's one. Number two is I find the planetary urban mm -hmm. already in Marx. Um, already, already in, I'm sorry, already. already in Marx, as in Karl. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Both in German ideology. Mm -hmm. Whereas against the Stalinist notion of socialism in one country, yeah, Marx imagined it as a global system. Yes, was was the thing that I that I thought about, uh, and then the later Marx would, by two of capital, the circulation process takes a global view of the circulation uh, of, of of capital as well, okay. and I was wondering what you what you thought of of that. And then just lastly, I thought there's an interesting kind of planetary in the local 
not just planetary as a kind of an external concept, which is, mm -hmm. in my view, the least interesting part of it, right. but more of a dialectical view of how the planetary is embedded in the local, in the urban. Richard Rodriguez said that he just wrote a paper yep. on the 1992 mm -hmm. LA Rebellion. He talked about a new third world coming screaming to life in America. Right. Um, and, and so I'm, I was wondering about that notion, and I was thinking about this university in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I was involved over the summer with uh, the Department of Planning and Development in Chicago. Everybody told me not to do it. Uh, because the sh Chicago is trying to develop a new comprehensive plan. plan. They haven't done one since 1966, when urban renewal meant Negro removal. Mm -hmm. And so, and yet, uh, the head of the urban planning department here at the University of Illinois, Lewis Wetmore, was part of that project. Um, and it's 1966. Well, what else was happening in 1966? Yeah. It was when Martin Luther King came to Chicago, with the Civil Rights Movement to Chicago. And so it wasn't until your talk that I put those two together yeah. in 1966. Was the comprehensive plan for Chicago of 1966 also a response to what's called the Chicago Freedom Movement mm -hmm. in Chicago, speaking about the resistance that you were, you were talking about? Um, and, you know, it was all couched in planning terms of slum removal and all that kind of stuff. Right. But King, you know, you know, moves into tenement house over on the west side of Chicago. And so I, I hadn't seen that until your talk. And it brings me back to the last point about Marx. The concept of technology for Marx was always not that it was introduced. It was always, when is it introduced? Yeah. And it's introduced new technology in order to suppress the resistance at the point of production of the working class. And so I'm, I'm thinking about this comprehensive plan in terms of when it is introduced. When is it developed for Chicago? Not simply for slum removal, but because at the, it was at the height right. of the Chicago Freedom Movement mm -hmm. and how planning is then used as a way to repress it. Right. Urban, urban movement, social movement. Right. Anyway, that was all inspired by you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to help. It's, it's good to see you. <laughs> That's a lot to comment on. Well, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot. All right. So, um, as I jotted some things down. So, the first point, um, David Harvey's point in in the book that you cite, where he talks about ethics and aesthetics. I think there's a really powerful um, theme in that book, which I. I'll go on a limb and say I substantially agree with. And that is that Harvey says that, that the era of postmodernism is nothing more, or little more, I'll try to be as accurate as possible, it's little more than the unfolding of late advanced capitalism. It's late capitalism's uh, newest form. And this idea that we have a clear break with the past is an illusion because the reality is we still see... Um, much of the globe participating in the capital accumulation process and continuously inventing and reinventing new technologies to do that. And aesthetics doesn't necessarily translate into core processes, what uh, Neil Brenner calls the real mechanisms that guide society. So I, I think that's the central theme that you're nibbling at. And I, I think that's a really important point. Uh, point number two. Marx. Um, you know, let me pay tribute to Marx. Aren't we always continuously reinvest, reinventing his ideas? And, you know, he was, he was a pretty sharp character. And I agree with you on that. I um, wish I could read my writing. So, um, the one thing that, that I would say that planetary urbanization differs from Marx's rendition of urbanization and uh, Brenner and Schmidt have been explicit about this, is they say that this new gaze, it's a new gaze, it's not a new process. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a new vista onto understanding the world. 
And it's a gaze that starts from the outside looking in rather than from the centroid of the city looking out. And once you do that, they say, and you begin to change spatial scales, the world becomes a very different place in terms of its mechanisms, its processes. And um, so in planetary urbanization, um, cities are truly, no, uh, let me take a step back, urbanization is truly a non-central phenomenon. And the good illustration is that um, you look at the Mott Foundation, right? Um, you know, foundations are taking over our country. It sounds very conspiratorial, I don't mean it. Though. But Mott, um, the Mott Foundation now is essentially determining how Flint is going to, to transform. And the Mott Foundation sits on billions of dollars. They're a multinational conglomerate. And their decisions are made by non-democratically elected people. It's kind of a scary proposition. Um, but kind of like the federalists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and in the process of, of Mott, how they function, if you want to understand segregation and discriminatory practices and new patterns of policing in Flint, um, planetary urbanization would say that what becomes as important to understanding the latest zoning ordinance that does this and the latest kind of policing strategy that does that is to, is to look at how they extract surplus through gold mining and lithium mining in Zimbabwe. Because they pad their wallets that way, and that sets off the process, a convoluted chain of events, where the end product is the appearance of them promoting segregation through a zoning ordinance. But it's that, it's that initial extraction of surplus that's just as important in the process. And if you see it that way, then all of a sudden the world changes a bit. That's the argument that's being made. I hope that makes sense. Oh, oh, do you yeah, want to go? go? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have a sort of semantic question that then builds into um, with uh, oh. your evocation of Dracula. Are you seeing him as the aberrant in this case, or what? What is the urbanization? The novel, or Dracula, or where? Where is he in that? Where's Dracula? Or where's the urban, for that matter? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, so it's really, the proper term for it is Dracula-itis. <laughs> because it's not so much Dracula as a person, but it's, it's, a, it's a set of processes. So um, in the writing of Dracula, um, when I was reading it, it was so eerie, the points that were being made in terms of how they applied to the governance of our cities today. So what's being referenced here is a set of processes that are going down in our urbanized places. And the novel itself um, serves up analogies for us to have a new kind of recognition about our cities. So it's, it's, not, the, it's not the Dracula person. That's why I asked, like, is it the percent. novel? Or, yeah, yeah, it, it's so. really not the novel. It's, <laughs> it's the sensibilities of, of what... Uh, Bram Stoker puts down. Mm -hmm. And then you, you take those, those ideas and you apply it to our city and you say there's a lot of eerie correspondence there. Um, because then from there, um, it's interesting that Dracula and Frankenstein, for that matter, are the two sort of metaphors here yeah. because neither of these novels spend very much time in the city at all. And so then yeah. my, my follow-up yeah. question yeah. is... Um, Given that, at least in England, where both of these novels are written, mm -hmm. um, urbanization result, because uh, you're talking about the aberrant and the rejection of the working class, right? Like the, the decline and um, these the very many aesthetics that you brought up in terms of that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, in order to create the urban, you need, you close the commons in order to bring the working class into the cities, right? Um, and so I guess my question is, what is the relationship to the rural that you're seeing, the non-urban, if you will, um, in relation to some of these aesthetics that you're bringing yeah, into play? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think, it's a, I think it's a really interesting question because it gets at something that I'm not sure about. Um, it, would be, it would be really wondrous to take the, the notions that um, Dracula-itis gives us and to see the degree to which it's applicable and to see whether it is truly applicable to suburbs and rural areas, and whether it's applicable 
to areas of the global south and the global north. So I, I'm, I'm talking about cities in a kind of abstract way. Sure. And I presented cities as a monolith, as I said. But your point raises the really interesting question to me of how, where do we apply this? And um, under what kinds of community building, right? Not so much city building, but community building, that it becomes very valuable to us. And by the way, I didn't answer two of your questions, though. I'm going to get back to that in a second. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, got a, I got a response to her question on, uh, <laughs> <laughs> on, on actually vampire. Marx in chapter 10 of Capital of the Working Day, within two pages, section two, called The yes. Voracious Appetite for Surplus Value, yeah. mm -hmm. cites vampire like capital and werewolf hunger. <laughs> well, you legitimately need a disposable population. So it's not just that you want to get rid of the working class. You need the working class to currently be circulating via death and through the city space. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Sayak was next in her life. Yes. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, I actually have one sort of comments and a second question. Okay. So uh, my comments is that like planetary urbanization as a theoretical framework mm -hmm. is quite hypes of or opposite to the postcolonial term or postcolonial urbanism. None of my question is coming uh, where you are bringing Simon or or kind of a local politics resistance. So for me, there there is two kind of groups. One is me, that is red gap theory. Uh, and and uh, Neil Brenner and on the other hand Simon or for example if we think about the fragments is coming in MacFarlane work right. like we just talking about you know talking from the margins mm -hmm. so so these these two things are in my understanding is really different and I'm mm -hmm. a bit skeptical you you very rightly did a reconciliation but in the process of reconciliation. Uh, do you, do you think that the Simmons work or MacFarlane's this notion in this uh, reconciliation can be undermined uh, to the um, and planetary urbanization can to some extent overpower it? So that's the one question. Yeah. And my okay. second question is, uh, uh, it's it's one of the first reading you suggested for the I think eco city or smart city. So at the, at the, in the conclusion, I just quoted, there is a term like, you know, circulation of information in real time and sensors. And uh, like, you know, its meters is monitors the production and consumption of energy. But this series takes place in the isolated buildings, which being disconnected from the surrounding built and natural environment yeah. and tend to foster social inequality and biodiversity. So uh, as I'm reading, rereading Leffel, to, for my own work, I, I found this idea of the disconnect and exclusion is, is completely different. Sure. And, and, and I think geographers never focused on uh, disconnect because I think exclusion is much exotic and easy to publish. So if you can yeah. give some yeah. lights yeah. on that. Yeah. So let me get at both your, your comments. Yeah. I'll start with the second one first. Okay. Um, because I remember it better. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, I, the really intriguing thing about Cugarello's idea of Frankenstein urbanism, yep. and whether we agree with it or disagree with it, um, and I think what's at the foundation of this thing, is the, is, the, is the difference between the rhetoric and the reality of how, for example, smart growth is proceeding in um, Abu Dhabi and um, the second city, which was the second city. Um, and so he, he gets... Singapore, Singapore, yeah. Um, so he, what he does is he gets at this, this abstract rhetoric of how smart city growth is going to be a unifying principle in the city. It's going to resolve dilemmas, economic, social, economic dilemmas in the city. The reality, on the other hand, is that these smart growth projects that are put in place are pale imitators of what they're really supposed to be. And... Um, um, smart growth itself consists of a set of um, sort of isolated projects, growth projects, which don't in any meaningful way link up to the betterment and the good of the broader city. So there's no holism in the individual projects. What's driving each project is capital accumulation and, and wealth 
securing by developers and builders. And of course that generates negative outcomes for so many people in the city. And yet you have that rhetoric that says that the smart city will be much more effective, it will be a much better place to live, if we can make things efficient, we can use science and technology to, um, to foster this, this kind of new age kind of urban environment. And he's saying no. The, the appropriate metaphor is Frankenstein. If you remember Frankenstein, it was a bunch of sutured together parts, right? And the monster proceeded, and the monster lurched along and was a very confused soul. That's what's going on in Singapore and Abu Dhabi. So that, that's what I think, in response to your point, that's, that's the strength of that. Um, the first point, I like Simone's piece juxtaposed against the other ones here. That's my, my, my predilection, my preference, because it's about political resistance. And my first two innovations actually carry to an extreme we can begin to think of a disempowered set of people on the ground. And you know, Dracula urbanism at this deep level, taken for grantedness, is, is hurting many people. Um, and decline urbanism as well, decline machines. And then along comes Abdul Malik Simone, and he says, you know what? It's in the, the interstices of the city, the cracks, the fabric. Uh, the crevices of the urban environment that we see amazingly creative individuals who are mediating these processes. And in their mediation, they're coming forth with something really meaningful. Right? They're enacting practices that actually help people on the ground who are among the most immiserated in the city. So I really like that juxtaposition. Yeah, this was really fascinating. And if I just want to make the decline machine paradigm speak to the people's infrastructure paradigm, I, I mean, what I don't understand is how this necropolitical project of the decline machine could work, given that, as you just said, from the people's infrastructure paradigm, you actually need the people to run the city. So how can you how can you force their deaths or or suck their blood the fatal way without actually bringing the city to a hold? I mean Saskia Sesson's yeah. point about the global city is that it actually needs this conglomeration of poor desperate people who provide the work for the you know the janitors the um, the, f the food uh, preparers etc cetera, etc cetera, that you need them right there yeah. in the city so if you make their living impossible in the city then I don't understand how that yeah. would work yeah well I'll say this that we see in case after case you see city policy in a way needing low wage residual labor right to fuel the fast food economy. Yeah. So many of these cities, in fact, I would speculate every one of them now um, has job growth. The bulk of its job growth is in low-wage service stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But for some reason, it's not preventing cities from enacting these draconian policies. There's another metaphor. Um, but but it's, it's enacting policies that are not just hurting, especially the racialized poor, but it's actually kicking them out of the city. And... Again, I'll invoke Chicago. Chicago is doing it just like many other Rust Belt cities. It ends up hurting the economy of the city um, because the labor is essential. But it's still being done. You know, that, that's one of the contradictions in our cities today. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you've identified a really important contradiction in our cities. And as you know, policy doesn't always proceed with the best imaginary of what's good for real estate capital and industrial capital and corporate capital. Um, they just do things. And in a way, that's where the Frankenstein metaphor comes into play. I see. I see. Yeah. 
it, this is a very <clears throat> tiny question, actually. But, uh, in your response to Michael here, you mm -hmm. mentioned the targeting of the racialized poor, and you just did as, as well now. And I'm wondering to what degree you actually develop the very clear notion at this point that Dracula is racist and not just a monster targeting random right. random. So the racial is, uh, you mentioned that you're not talking about racial capitalism here specifically, but in your uh, when you said the the ones that you the urbanism that you chose, the four you chose, mm -hmm. you acknowledge some other ones that you were not going to talk about, but you know you acknowledge those. Right. So Oh, gotcha. yeah. okay. Until, um, is it important to just not see Dracula as a monster, but as a racist, colonialist, and all kinds of monsters, monsters with other yeah. physical therapy? Yeah, well, I have a short answer for that. And that was yes. supposed to be a short <laughs> question. Um, there, there's, there's, there's deep racism that exists in the domains of public policy in our cities and in the supposed truths that power brokers have in our cities. Um, racism is something that permeates the construction of public policy in our cities. I think there's, there's no doubt about that. And Dracula-itis as a, as, a, as a set of processes very much embodies it. And um, I guess my, my concluding point that I didn't really talk about racial capitalism, maybe I talked about it more than I, I said I did. <laughs> That's a good point. Oscar. Yeah, such a rich talk. Thank you. Huh. Uh, Thank you. When you're speaking about decline machines, Me, it struck me that you could be just as well have been addressing the situation of the 18th century Europe, uh, where all of these issues are being discussed. It right. made me think, therefore, about the historical legacies. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that I'm following up on Shusha's uh, question about what that. Uh, what that might mean in terms of the targeting uh, of spe specific racialized sectors, you know, for the yeah. Dracula or the decline machines. Uh, I'm wondering what the historical difference might be now, especially given that if we think about some of these myths, the Dracula myths, uh, the, the Dracula characters have tra been transformed into something very different in a contemporary society. To think about yeah. uh, uh, interview with a vam uh, vampire, vampire diaries, they've become something very different from Stoker's character. Oh, yeah. Blade. 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 Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think to me what you're getting at is something really quite important and something difficult to tease out analytically. But the, the present always embeds the past in it. And when we see um, Dracula-itis as unfolding in our cities today, and I'm actually pretty persuaded that it's, it's happening, um, so I, I'm persuaded by, by the point. Um, I mean, that, that has roots in neo-Darwinism and, and decades and decades in the past of the the array of assumptions and meanings that went into that and which pervasively get updated and filtered into understandings of the present. And when we talk about the habitats of, of key decision makers in our cities, um, the past embeds in what they're thinking and what their truths are. Um, as an analytic project, I think it's difficult to tease it out, but it's a very important project. Mm -hmm. Um, I just have a couple of, um, would like some <coughs> clarification on two things. Sure. First of all, the use of killing when you were talking. Yeah. And um, I was trying to understand killing without leading to conspiracy. Yeah. And your insistence over and over and over, there is not a conspiracy mm -hmm. for your proposal. Mm -hmm. 
And um, it made me think of another phrase that perhaps you don't want to use, um, but that perhaps um, could, I was trying to understand it this way. It's by Foucault's idea of letting die yeah. rather than yeah. killing, yeah. which is less perhaps subjectively conspiratorial um, than a killing. Right. Um, but I mean, it's, this is just something that I was trying to grapple with. Or do you, do you mean it stronger in a, in a stronger way? Yeah. Yes, I actually mean it in a stronger way. I like the idea of, of letting die. I think that captures something meaningful. And yet, I have a sense that it's, it's not just about letting die. It's about, I'm actually going to use the word execution. <laughs> but, um, and, and I'm searching for the right words here. But it's the execution of people's ways and dispositions and pathways. It's not the literal killing of people, but it's, it's the attempt to annihilate um, what they are, what their, what their social spaces are. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult to find the right words to communicate that. And letting die actually takes me partially there. But I want to go a little bit further than that. It's a, it's a really interesting point. Post biopolitics analysis? Like Foucault gives us like three yeah. forms of government. Is this the fourth in some way? Um, actually, somebody said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, governmentality, um, biopolitics. Maybe it, may, well, to me, governmentality and biopolitics is, is a bit different, but maybe this is an addendum to that. Yeah, yeah. I think this is more necropolitics. <laughs> Make yeah. die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but in terms yeah. Which is past, you know, if you want to well, theorize. Course. But like in terms of what you were asking, like at mm -hmm. the same time that you're making die, you also have to make live at some level because you lose your labor population. And they both mm -hmm. go together. And that is a lot of what Foucault is talking about is the management mm -hmm. of population at that level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I just, one of the things that stuns me <laughs> is, is the public policies that are enacted especially on the racialized poor in our cities, which seems so contrary to, to what you're suggesting. That, that um, and of course you can see Trump doing the same thing, right, with his immigration policy, and yet the, the, the cheap residual labor is so essential to this crazy economy that we have in the United States. And, um, yeah. <laughs> I think this is related to that point, because in, in your four categories, two, four, and maybe three, you were talking about human choice, habitas, subjectivity, the imaginary, and truths. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Um, and that those all affect planning, basically, that we don't they acknowledge affect them. They affect planning, right? They affect yeah. what we do, our policies, the sure. way we, we act. Yeah. And so my question to you is, so how do you affect subjectivity, habitas, and the imaginary. Because, I mean, if all of this is about making, you know, enacting, doing, acting on the yeah. city, yeah. then, and if those things are fundamental to those actions, then how does one act upon the imaginary? Do you see what I'm saying? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Is, um, that, a, is that a fair question? Well, it's a fair question. It's a very difficult question to give a definitive response to. And it's difficult because... Um, in a way, it's the age-old question of, of how you transform politics from being extremely afflicting and regressive to something that's progressive. And um, I, I don't have an answer to that, except that I would suggest that we have to start targeting not just practices, um, but actually the meanings that exist in practices and, and make them problematic to people, hmm. make them make them problematic. Hope they jump spatial scales and they become a, a, a national phenomenon. Um, in, in the jump scaling thing, and also to problematize language, because language is such a, a pervasive conveyor of of the, the deep racist tr truths that exist in our cities today, and. To find a way, and I don't have the solution to it, but to make problematic certain terms. The black underclass, right? The ghetto, the slum. 
and strip them of their meanings and their connotations, um, and make that make that a, a, a progressive politics. I think would be would be fantastic. David, how do you see Jackson, Mississippi, in the context of your work with Black? Um, I see it just one more case. Yes. It's it's not surprising. It's it's what else is new under the sun? Quite frankly. Mm -hmm. It's, um, it's extremely racialized. It's very class. And um, it's it probably, at this risk of sounding cynical, it's, it's a process, set of processes that are going to continue. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised when we see it unfold again and again in other places. And it's, it brings me back to the idea of the mechanism or set of mechanisms that, that direct this. And it's not the aesthetics that's doing it. It's not the epiphenomena that are directing those sorts of processes. It's, it's the processes themselves. I sound really cynical. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about whether, um, in relation to what a lot of people are asking about, like why are you know kicking out the, the labor that the cities need in order to really thrive and be successful? But mm -hmm. and I, think, I was thinking about what you were talking about with the gaze. So you know what you're saying is this change is that people are looking at the cities from the outside in, or from the outside, right. whereas the, the gaze used to be from the in out. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether, well, if you're looking in from the inside, then you kind of have to pluck the people out because you've got sort of an encapsulated thing that's the city. Yeah. And you just have to sort of get rid of that element in, in order to introduce a new element. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're looking from the inside out, you can just kind of push people. In a sense, you know what I mean, and yeah. then and then there can be there can be phenomena like well they just keep going to the outer neighborhoods and so forth. They still come in and they work or something, and they're just sort of pushed out in a way. Sure. So that sure. and I'm just wondering what that it seems related to me, and I, you know what I mean. So yeah. the gaze yeah. is what's making this kind of crazy policy, where you're just getting rid of the labor you need because yes. you're looking at things from the outside yes. in. Yes. Would that be right? Would that be yes? Right? I think that's a really good point. But I'm going to play devil's advocate for yeah. a second. Just suppose that in a place like Flint, Michigan, um, people on the ground were made aware of, of the powerful connections between supply chains and um, the extraction of surplus in, again, in lithium and gold mining in, in Zimbabwe, and how that is essential to putting down um, a, a very repressive kind of policing. And Mott Foundation is, is underwriting all of this stuff in Flint. It's underwriting um, this new policing strategy and the, the gentrifying of the downtown. And to make the connections and to see them as inseparable and dependent on one another can be potentially eye-opening to people. And if they're going to organize and, 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 and try to change things, um, that becomes an important insight. So looking from the outside to the inside has its utility as well. Okay. So it's not all bad. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. I think I'm going to take advantage of that sort of break, okay. sit quarter off, and thank you for this wonderful talk and thank for the you. great conversation.